Good morning, folks. I'm so pleased that you all could take the time uh, to join us for this webinar today. Uh, my name is Kendall Miller. I'm one of the founders of Gibraltar Software, and I'm really pleased to be able to take this opportunity to walk through what we've done with our new Loop 3.5 version and how we deliver, as we like to say, indispensable error management for .NET applications. Today we're going to walk through almost entirely new functionality that's brand new in this release, although we'll try to bring some connections back to uh, the older Gibraltar product that, that Loop replaces. Uh, so, you, so if you've been using our products all along, you'll see how this all fits together and delivers more value for you. Um, if not, if you're new to the product, that's fine. Don't worry. We're, you're going to be able to follow along just, just fine. So just to help folks who are coming along from uh, the Gibraltar product, let's take a look at, at, at how these two compare. And really, it's pretty straightforward. If we look at the two, basically, the Loop product replaces uh, the Gibraltar product. The Loop agent and Gibraltar agent are cross-compatible. Uh, uh, our new Loop desktop replaces the old Gibraltar analyst. It's a newer version of the same application. And Loop server replaces Gibraltar hub. In each case, really, we've done a bit of branding work, but we've really upped the capabilities of the tools, and that's why we wanted to go with the new name. It really focuses in the mission uh, that we have, which is we're focusing in on this requirement of runtime and production error management as being the core capability that folks need uh, out of the platform. So with that, let me uh, not bore you with the PowerPoint, but instead get straight into uh, looking at the application. So this is what I would see. We're actually looking at, by the way, today we're going to demo from one of our test systems. So you can see there's a lot of data, in, a fair amount of data in this system. And um, we're going to walk through one specific test application, but I want you to see what it looks like where, where you as a user just start in by logging in. So if this is the dashboard you get when you first log into the system. One of the things we wanted to make sure you could do with Loop was handle the case where you have a development team that have a lot of uh, different applications they're managing, different sub-teams all trying to share the same uh, infrastructure. So Loop is designed to give you a number of ways to let you have one Loop server, but share it amongst multiple development teams, possibly people moving between those development teams, your support organization looking into it with a slightly different set of concerns and capabilities that they're looking for, and have that work and scale up with large numbers of applications or sessions within applications or problems within individual applications. Now, before I continue, I do want to emphasize today that uh, I'd love to see your questions as we go. You'll notice in the webinar control panel that there's a questions area where you can type a question. If you go ahead and type that in when you have one, uh, I'll loop back and get to it uh, at, the, at the most convenient point in the conversation so we can make sure that all those questions get answered and, um, and, and we can keep the conversation flow going. That's one of the big advantages of a webinar, right, is that you can actually ask questions and ask me to go in deeper on something or challenge me on the way something works as we go. So please go ahead and do that using the, the webinar controls. We'll also have time at the very end of the webinar. We set aside a certain amount of time for questions. And if you have anything that you uh, that, that comes up after today's webinar, please just reach out to us by emailing support at gibraltarsoftware.com, and we'll be sure to get your, your question answered right away. That email address goes into a queue that's monitored by the entire development team, so we really make sure work to make sure that, that questions get answered as rapidly as possible. Okay, and with that, let me progress in to our sample application. For today's demonstration, we uh, have a sample application published by Acme Software that we're going to use our little test application. Yes, we're really creative about naming these things. Now, each application that you have gets a badge on this dashboard. That, dash, that badge gives you a certain amount of summary information about the application and its current status. If you're working on an application, of course, as I scroll down, you can see that there's all these applications available that we might have run on this system. But I can click this favorite to mark applications I really care about, and that moves them to the top of the screen. You can see that I myself am monitoring the use of, of Loop Desktop and Server and the various bits of Loop. By the way, this is a, our beta community that you're seeing their traffic coming in because this is what we use this hub for. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drill into the, uh, uh, the actual test application. And let's go ahead and start with the list of uh, open issues. Now, there's two big capabilities within the system that, that we're going to talk through today, issue management and usage tracking. And I think it's really helpful to think about it from the perspective of different folks on the team. And I like to start with the uh, perspective of a technical lead. We'll talk a little bit later about a product manager or developers and how they all work 
and the different ways that Loop works for them. Well, let's start with a technical lead. Now, as a technical lead, one of the things you often have to do is triage and understand the, what's happening in the real world. And to do that, to understand, to see what's, what's out there, we have this event review list. What this is, is this is where, as all of your application, no matter where it's running, in, you know, on developer boxes, in QA, in production, whatever, as it's reporting back information, each time a unique new problem is discovered, it's placed on this list. So as a technical lead, I can use this list to show me the things that we haven't yet decided something about. We haven't triaged them to decide what they are. Are they bugs? Are they operational problems? Uh, maybe configuration problems? Or user errors? Or even log messages that were maybe written as an error that frankly really shouldn't have been. So I'm confronted with this list. And we let you do a number of things with the item on this list. One of the things you can do is you can uh, take something and say that we know this is a problem and we want to go ahead and open an issue for this item. So as I look at this list, for example, I can see this uh, order item quantity must be greater than zero. That looks a little concerning to me. And uh, that feels like it's probably a defect. Now, let me drill into that a little bit. As I drill in, I get to see more information about that item. Loops automatically displaying all of the summary information we gather about that. Now, in this case, this particular event only happened to one person on one computer, so not very broadly. Uh, I can see down here a summary of the actual log data from when it occurred. Down at the bottom, I can see information about the machine characteristics where it happened on. If this issue starts happening on more and more systems, it will automatically extend the analysis you see below to, to include the different operating systems or memory or what have you that those systems are using so that you can see more and more about what, uh, what machine characteristics it's happened on and uh, what versions of the software it's happened on. At the moment, though, I want to drill in a little deeper and look at specifically at this occurrence. So I can go ahead now and click View Event, and I'll be looking at the exact log event uh, that for this individual problem. So now I've zoomed down from the top level where we started of it's a unique problem that's happened somewhere in the world down to it happened on this exact computer at this time. Uh, it only happened once. It didn't recur during that session. And here's the information about it. You'll notice that I can see uh, information such as the method that it happened in, as well as if you publish symbol files, I can actually see the source code location where it happened. Now, you notice there's also an exception tab here. If I go click the exception tab, I see the analysis of the exception as it was recorded. Now, this exception isn't particularly deep and detailed um, because it was thrown and caught within the application itself in a relatively shallow call stack. If I wanted to, by the way, if I wanted to, say, take this exception and paste this information in something else, say maybe this uh, call stack was obfuscated, I could use the copy op option here to copy the call stack off and paste it in uh, the obfuscator or I could use the copy option here to copy the entire uh, thing you're seeing below. Maybe I wanted to externally put it into an email or, some, or save it off for some other external reason. Additionally, we look at the set of exceptions and their call stacks, and going through them, attempt to determine where exactly uh, did the code transition happen between the last code you wrote and the thing that sourced the exception. That's part of our root cause analysis. This is particularly effective when dealing with web applications, where you'll have very tall call stacks. Uh, but, it, but the salient point is usually right in the middle of it, where you transition from uh, your code back to framework code. And that's what we'll call out here in this. You can see, for example, that I can tell my business logic, create invalid order item, cause an argument exception when invoking the set quantity. The exception information was that the order quantity must be greater than zero. So from this, I've got a pretty good summary of this error just in that root cause analysis. If I want to see more information that's available, I hover over any of these. The tooltip shows me, for example, what line of the application each of these came from, where that, where that symbol information is available. Now, in this case, if it's not enough, if I cannot determine if this is or isn't an issue from this, I can click Open Session. When I do that, Web Browser will prompt me, because of course we're invoking another application, and if I allow that, it will then start Loop Desktop if it's not already running and open the particular session data file. 
So in this case, you can see from my short test run, I now have a session data file that shows me everything that's happened in that session. Using this, a developer or other person can, can go from the web interface, once they've gotten down to the bottom of the web UI, they can use the open session option to go deeper. That lets the web application and the desktop application uh, cooperate and work together to get problems solved. And this is important because our research has shown that 45% of the time, a developer can understand and solve the issue purely from the information that we're presenting in the web UI. About 45% of the time, though, they're going to need more detail, namely an understanding of the context that led up to a particular problem. And that's where Loop excels in its ability to have that additional log data present uh, in your application, even though they're not warnings or errors, leading up to an actual problem. You'll notice that those two add up to 90%, and the answer to that is the remaining 10% requires external information that's not available in the diagnostic platform. But you consider that the ability to go down below just having the exception information, to having the additional logging data and the context that error happened in is a great capability that makes a big difference in almost half of all problems. I'm going to go back up to the review list now. We've been looking at this problem, and I've decided as technical lead that this is something that needs investigation. I'm going to go ahead, and I want to get in a developer to investigate this. So I'm going to tell the system, I want to create a new issue for this. I can then, if I want to, modify the caption or the description of the problem uh, to suit what I, what I now understand and communicate that understanding to the developer. I can also, if the, I have already worked out a workaround for this problem, I can document that in the workaround section. I'm going to go ahead and install this to another alias of myself and create the issue. Once I create the issue, it's no longer on the review list. And the reason for this is, of course, I've now decided what to do with it. I've decided to make an issue, so there's no reason for it to still require review. Now, you may notice Outlook has prompted me to receive an email. Let me pull up this email. As the developer, when this got created and assigned to me, an email was generated telling me about the, the problem that was assigned. Now, with this particular mail account, I've opted to receive plain text, unformatted emails. These aren't, of course, the most attractive emails, but they do work on any device, on any platform, and in plain text. They tell me a lot of information about the item, and they include a link where, as a developer, I can go straight to the issue. If I've opted to receive HTML emails, I get a much more attractive email. Here's an example of an HTML email for a new error. You can see here, there's a new event waiting for review, and I can click to view this information. Nice to get to the, the other detail down below. This is just an example of one of many notifications that we have built into the system that are designed to make it easy to work with and incorporate into your existing workflow. So I've talked about adding an issue, but there's other things that we know happen that aren't, don't quite fit in that category, and Loop is designed to handle them as well. Because the main goal we had with Loop was to make sure that you could safely, in production, have all of your possible problems coming into it, then triage it and work it down to only those actual defects that really were, were software issues that had to be managed as software defects. Now, as I look at this remaining list, I can see this here. Unable to connect to network server connection has been lost. Now, this feels like a transient operational problem. Let me go ahead and drill in a little bit and just briefly look at it. And I think this is actually a transient problem. So initially, I'm going to go ahead and tell it, I'm just going to ignore this. By ignoring it, I'm going to get it off the review list. But I'm not saying for sure I know it's not a defect or it is a defect. If it reoccurs, it will get back on my list. I happen to have another instance of the same problem. I'm going to go ahead and ignore that one as well. Now, I should say that was another unique place where that occurred. So now I've pretty well worked the list down to except these last two items that are from uh, previous runs we did of the demo application. The last thing we allow you to do, we talk about creating an issue and ignoring it, which defers it. But the other thing you can do is you can suppress a problem. By suppressing a problem, you're saying, this is a non-issue. I don't want to ever see this come back again. I'm going to demo a scenario where you'd use that in, in a minute. Okay. I've now assigned an item off to the developer. The developer got an email, and now they want to come in and work on the problem. Now, one of the things they can do, of course, is they can simply click the link that they received in the email and go into the dash, go into the system straight to that problem.
when they do this, they're going to see all the information that's known about this issue at this time. They can see it's an active issue. They see the caption that I, I left when I created it, the description I left when it was created, which were defaulted from the error message itself. I didn't document a workaround when I sent it to them. Um, so this is all the information we know at this time. Now, it's not unreasonable as a developer. I might take a look at this, pull up the latest application code, and first say, let me rerun the application, just to make sure that this is still a problem. I'm going to go ahead and just run my test application. Now, it's a console application, so it doesn't display anything particular, particularly interesting. I don't want to go deeply into, uh, obviously, our trivial sample app. But you can see we're calling a number of business logic functions and letting them log things as it happens. Now, as I go back down to the issue, having now just run the problem, a couple things have happened. First is that you'll notice that now we see this happened uh, two sessions because, of course, I ran the application a second time. And in fact, our last seen timestamp has changed versus the first seen timestamp. Let me go ahead and drop that back down again. As a developer, often as I would be working on an issue like this, I would be using Loop Desktop locally to help me understand things. I'm going to go ahead and list the, this up now. And in fact, I can see in my local sessions area, I can see each time the application is run, including the time I just, I just ran it. I'm going to go ahead and open that up and take a look at the problem. If I look at this order item quantity, I can see the same information that was available on the website, but now in this UI and in context of all the log events that came up before it. I can see additional information that Loop's gathering that we don't always present on the website, such as all the list of the threads that were, that were uh, running in the application, as well as the complete list of assembly information for all the assemblies that were loaded uh, during the process's run and where those assemblies came from. This is useful to understand, for example, if a problem is still recurring because it happened due to due, um, a, a fix not being correctly deployed. Maybe one assembly was not updated out of the set of all assemblies. I can see, of course, the session details up here that tells me uh, the machine characteristics of where the session was run on um, and all the log data. Up top, we display performance counter information. Now, this session didn't run. Uh, for except one second, so there's really no performance data available. I'm not going to go much deeper into the desktop capability other than to mention that the desktop application has all of this available for developers, and Loop Desktop is a free application. You can go to our website, download the Loop install, and get the agent and desktop you're seeing now uh, for free for use, and you don't even have to give us your email address. So you can use this as a developer for local diagnostics with no issue. Let me go ahead and close this at the moment and take a, uh, go back and make a change to my application. Now, I've looked at this and decided that, in fact, this create invalid order that causes the error. Let's go ahead and, 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 and look at this actually in more detail. I, go, I pull back up this in Loop Desktop. I go look at this. Because I'm running on my local development machine, not only do I have the exception, but it's actually highlighting for me the line where this is happening. So I can look at this in the actual code. I can see where the exception got thrown. And it's where, in fact, we, a value, we give it a value less than 0. Now let's say that as a developer, I realize that this happened because un under the covers, we didn't uh, protect ourselves from a partial um, add. So the exception itself is just a byproduct of another problem or another error. And in fact, can be ignored. No problem. I can go into the into loop now and say as developer what I found. I'm going to go to the notes tab. I'm going to go ahead and add a note to this saying this issue is caused by a partial order being saved. It is uh, safe to ignore and should be handled differently in the parent application. I can go ahead and add that comment. Now, I have a choice. I could resolve the issue, or in this case, what I really want to say at the issue level is that this is not a problem. So I want to suppress this from recurring, because we're going to see more occurrences of this error, but we don't want to have the issue reopen. Now that I've suppressed it, it's marked as suppressed, and if I go and look at, my open, uh, at open issues, I won't see this issue listed in the list of open issues. It will be listed in the closed issues without a fixed inversion because it wasn't actually corrected as a defect. It was, in fact, 
uh, suppressed. Now I see someone's asked a question that is a great question, which is, uh, do we integrate with uh, defect management systems um, issue, or other issue management systems like TFS? And let me talk about that for a minute. The answer is that, yes, we do integrate with in issue management systems. We provide an API for such integration, and we publish in the system uh, plugins for that API to do the management for hog bugs and countersaw. Um, we are working on and planning plugins for JIRA and TFS. Um, we do recognize, though, that TFS installs are often very unique to a particular company. And so uh, we would encourage you, if you're looking for TFS integration, to reach out to us to support and discuss your particular situation. But we recognize that uh, you want to have this stuff go into one common workflow queue. And so, in fact, the system is designed around that. The way it integrates with that is that uh, a, an item really shouldn't go into the defect tracking system until it is an open issue, because that means that someone has triaged it and determined it is a real problem, and they want it to actually be activated in the defect tracking system. There's also support in the application, I'm not demoing today, for having links, that you can have a link from Loop into another system and vice versa, you can link directly into one of Loop's issues from that system. And that means you don't have to duplicate all of the runtime intelligence that Loop is gathering in the defect tracking system. You can just refer the user back to Loop for that information. OK, I'm going to go back to the review list. Now, you remember previously I said I wanted to ignore this unable to connect to the network server error. I ignored it because I thought maybe this was a transient problem and it, would, it really was an operational issue and would just go away. But the reality of it is, is that apparently our network is still having some issues. Now, as a developer, if I feel I've done all I can to recover from a network problem, there's not much I can do if the network is flaky and not much really is my responsibility. It's not technically a software defect. So I don't want this to keep showing up on my statistics and reopening for review. So I'm going to go ahead and suppress this application event. In doing so, we haven't deleted the event from the system, but we've said that this, this event is no longer interesting to the development team, and we don't want to receive alerts for it. We also don't want to open it as an issue. Now, it, when I said it isn't deleted, it's still available. If I go down and click on the suppressed list, I can see all the items we've suppressed. So as a technical lead, my goal is to keep this list clean and assign things to developers that are really issues. As a developer, I want to be able to work issues that are assigned to me with up-to-date information. So we've shown how you can go into uh, your issue list. You can uh, you see your issues. You can take an issue, and you can work to fix it. You can also assign it to another individual. So for example, I can go ahead and take an open, a particular open issue, and I can go ahead and assign it to another person or make other comments on them. So for example, this particular issue that's been open for a while in the sample application it's currently assigned to Gary Short, I can go in and I can add a note to it uh, if I understand more information about it. I can edit it to say I want to actually reassign it to somebody else. I'm going to go ahead and assign this to myself. Um, and I can take other actions on it. Now, let's look at another problem, an actual cycle of an actual fix resolve problem. I'm going to go ahead and introduce an error into my application, a crashing error at that. Let's go ahead and put this to the top. So here's a new little problem that we've introduced. Let's go ahead and run the application. And actually revert back to my technical lead persona. And I can come in and see that there is, in fact, a new critical error, a crashing error uh, for this, this says part not found. It's happened one time, but it is a crash. So I'm going to go ahead and take that and just assume it's a real problem, create a new issue for it, and assign it to my good, my good alias. As a developer now, let me go ahead and take a look at this problem. It's my part not found problem. I can see that, in fact, again, I can see a summary of it here. I can see the detail of where it happened down here. I view event. I can go look at the exception and, again, see program main 
cause an invalid operation exception invoking business logic and valid part, part not found. And I can see that, in fact, we captured those logs even on that, that line. Let me go ahead and look down at this problem. And I can see that, in fact, the error is happening on line 64 of business logic. So without even opening up the local log viewer, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the code at that location. Let me go ahead and take a look at my sample out. My business logic. And in fact, I'm looking for what line 64. So in fact, here's our exception. So what this is doing is it's in fact throwing a part not found exception. And uh, not surprisingly, because it's a unit test we designed to actually fail to find a part and throw an exception. It didn't. So I look at this and realize, OK, the problem with this is that, in fact, this code is wrong. The code is inverted. When the part is not null, it's throwing this. When it is null, we're throwing that. The problem is we're looking for the wrong part number. So in fact, what we want to do is find part 5, not part 6. Let me go ahead and do that and run the application. And I'm going to look locally to verify, did I actually appear to fix the issue? Actually, I didn't. We're getting a crash from that. Let me look in greater detail. Ah, there's my other error, which of course we hit. Unexpected part found. So I've got a second issue in the same block code. Sure, when it's not null, we throw this. That's not what we wanted to do. Gosh, we didn't do well at all at this. So in fact, at this, what we should be doing is we want to now use the part. OK. Now I believe I've addressed the issue. And by the way, this is absolutely not good coding style. So don't uh, read anything into that. Run the application again. Take a look. And in fact, I can see that that one ran normally, did not crash, even though it did generate errors, as we would expect, because we didn't do anything to address the network error that we were seeing before. I now go back into loop, and now I fix this issue. I'm going to go back to my part not found error and, in fact, tell it, OK, I have resolved this. Now, when I say I've resolved it, I want, it wants me to tell it, what version did I fix this in? So it prompts me and helps me understand I, it was last seen in this version. If it was last seen in that version, it can't have been resolved in that version or an older version. So it prompts me with the next version available. I'm going to go ahead and accept that and say that the issue is now resolved. Now that it's resolved, I can see the versions it was seen in and the version it was fixed in so that for all time we understand where this fit in our version tree, the version range it happened across, and where it was ultimately addressed. Also on the notes side, we've automatically added an audit note saying that my user identity resolved it, indicating it was fixed in a specific version. This is really handy because if something were to subsequently happen to this issue, then we can go back and see the transcript of what's happened with that item over time. Now, by the way, as a as as someone who, as the person actually responsible for this item, I've been receiving emails as the item was changed. So I can in fact see that in fact the recent notes the issue was resolved by this person. Okay. Now let's say that, as sometimes happens, some developer came back in here and looked at this code and said, that is just a crazy convoluted way to do this. What we should be doing is checking for null and throwing an exception, and then going ahead and using the part. But when they did that, they incorrectly forgot to change my negation case. So they've now changed it and think, good, I've made this code code more straightforward. I've eliminated that silly middle return right in the middle of the application, and that's a better way for this to work. And they're so sure of the solution that they just go fire and forget, check this bad boy in, and away we go. Now, of course, if they were to use Loop Desktop locally, they'd see that, in fact, that session crashed. More importantly, though, as I got reported to the server, it reactivated the issue. It reactivated the issue because, as the note says, 
It was automatically reopened because it reoccurred in this new newer version, which is higher than the documented fixed-in version. This is part of our automatic management of this in production. So what's happening here is that um, if I go back into Loop Desktop, I can, or I'm sorry, the web interface, I can see this again, where this issue's now been reactivated. On the notes side, I see the same notes information, and it's removed the fixed-in version and updated the last seen-in version. So as it's happened, um, I can in, now drill down into this to see what's happened. So if I go down to Application Event, I can see here's our parts not found. I can drill into this item, and I can see the now it's, that we have multiple occurrences on multiple sessions, still on just one computer. Now, if I had multiple computers, and I'll show you an issue later that's happened on many systems, so you can see how the, how the inf display data below would automatically include additional information of the memory and other characteristics of that. Um, I could now decide to triage and research this more by, for example, looking at the statistics side of this, where we're showing things like, in this case, um, breakdown by version of how often the issues happen, or by other common characteristics that we've found tend to correlate to um, problems. For example, they may be localized to a particular computer or user, operating system version, time zone, culture, etc. So for example, if you know your application is used very widely, um, you can uh, go ahead and group by culture and see if the problem is only happening in one narrow culture. So that gets um, that lets us look at a cross set of all the places where this item occurs and understand the characteristics of those systems. And in fact, you'll notice that by the way, not only give me the chart, but it's giving me the grid below of the specifics, so I can understand the details behind the individual items. Okay, now naturally, I'd want to go fix this issue again, and I can do so by as a developer going back and merely correcting the incorrect negation logic. When I do so and run the application again. I can now resolve this item again. And in fact, there's that new version that it is now detected. And it's greater than the last version it saw it in, so I can go ahead and resolve it. Having now done that, it's resolved again. I can. Um, actually did this, by the way, down in the session event. If I go back up to the issue, I can go into the Notes tab and see, in fact, that it's been re-resolved in this new version. Now, the statistics at the issue level tell me information, particularly about how this has happened over time, by day. Now, of course, this issue we're demonstrating today, so it doesn't really show against time. But it does, um, but that often would happen in the real world. And I'll pick a real issue from our production environment a little later, so you can see that type of data. Okay, so as a developer, I've been able to go through, get an issue assigned to me, address it, check in my fix, say did build and validation the build system, and only if my fix really holds does my resolution stay closed. If it reoccurs in a later version, then the item gets reopened. Now that later version aspect is a very important point. So for example, it may be that um, the issue is still happening because it's, of course, still happening in production. So if it's still happening in production, um, but on a version that we know is before the version we declared is fixed, that is additional information about the problem. But it isn't, in fact, a reason to reopen the issue. Because, of course, if you've declared it fixed in, say, version 17256, and it's still happening in version number before that, that's entirely consistent and to be expected. right? So. This is all part of, of the way Loop works with the real world with gathering all this data from production because we recognize that you know, there's, a, there's a lag between when a developer fixes something and when it will actually be resolved out in the field when it gets deployed. That also hits the support use cases where a support person, for example, may want to come in because even though this issue is resolved, if I'm a support person, I may have heard from a user that there's a problem with issues around parts not being found incorrectly. I could be looking at this and go, OK, tell me about part not found. When I do that, we do a full text search. 
and we come back with, for the application, any matching issue, the top 1,000 matching events, and, and actual individual log detail events. So from this search, for example, I can see down here literally the each application occurrence where this happened that included this text. Now, I said part not found. And it's interestingly, it also matched because it was very close on the phrase unexpected part found. Now, that's useful if I'm in support because as a support person, often I'll get a fragment of a message. These will say something like, um, yeah, the website had a problem. It said something about not found or a part, something like that. And I want to be able to find the exact issue. And then when I do that, say, ah, yeah, this looks like it. It's probably this part not found item. I can actually see then, OK, it's been resolved, but it was fixed in this version. And in fact, this version hasn't been deployed yet. So therefore, that's why we don't, um, that's why they're still experiencing the problem, because they're running a version older than this. Um, so that lets the support team understand a bit about um, how they, um, you know, the actual status of things. It just goes to the classic developer problem of I fixed something um, on I fixed something on one hand in development. We may even have put it through the QA, but it hasn't come back yet and been resolved uh, in the production field system. Therefore, users really are still experiencing that. And we're going to keep going down that path with a lot of features as, as time goes on because it's, it's a capability we feel is really important and fundamental to error management. So we've talked a lot about issues. And we've talked about it from the standpoint of technical leads and from the standpoint of uh, developers. But let's move it up one level of the management chain. If I'm a product manager, how does this help me? Well, one of the things that we really want to be able to do as a product manager is understand the overall quality and health of our application. A great way to do that is, of course, I can look at the list of all open issues to understand all of the unresolved problems out there. I can also look at the closed issues and look at the fixed inversions, which you can sort by this column, to understand, for example, the question, have we fixed enough things that's worth shipping to production a new build? Because I can see the fixed in for runtime issues. But one of the things that our feedback from customers has told us that they value the most is this top list, where we can see of all of these set of open items, which ones are either happening the most in the field or are the most widespread, happening to the most people. So most frequent would mean happening in the most processes that are out there. Most widespread would mean happening to the most computers out there. Now, depending on my particular application or other concerns, I might give weight a lot to one of these over the other. And do I care about most frequent or most widespread? But it gives me a good way to understand, of all the problems happening in the world, which of these do I really need to look at right now? Now, by the way, we had a great question that just came in um, on the webinar, which is, how big can loop scale? We're currently logging 1.5 million informational bug messages, starting twice that many bug messages each day. The answer is loop can scale astoundingly. And let me give you some numbers from actual production customers. We have an actual production customer that on a single server is receiving 500,000 sessions per day. That's unique application runs. Each session has typically 50,000 to 100,000 log messages in it. Our architecture is designed to handle this because what we do is all of that log data, which comes in as a highly compressed form, gets analyzed. And the distinct warnings, errors, and criticals get recorded into the indexing system behind the website you're seeing here. Now, I say the distinct. What happens is if uh, a particular error happens many times in one session, and I'm going to go ahead and give you an example of that, where if you remember our network timeout, if I go into this, you see that it has 32 occurrences in four sessions. In other words, it's happening eight times in every session. But we optimize how we record that information so that, in fact, as I drill into this, what we're showing you is the complete details of the first occurrence in that process and the time range and, and count of the number of occurrences in the website. But the detail information is still available. If I click Open Session, then I'm now opening the actual log file. And when I do so, all of that information is available. And we have folks that have log files that are millions of messages long. So from that, you can actually see how the architecture scales to let you handle um, 
many, many, many messages coming in or many systems sending messages in or both. And it analyzes through that information in the background to pull just the, the really salient, useful stuff to the top in this web UI and make it scale from there. We have customers that generate massive amounts of data and run it through Loop. So we've designed it to handle a huge amount of scale for that. Our general design principle with Loop was we want you to log everything you imagine is useful to log. And then we want to make the infrastructure we put the burden on it, namely our application, to be able to knock that information down to manageable chunks of size. OK, so <clears throat> with that, let me continue through another set of use cases for a product manager. We've been talking about as a product manager, I can look at my top issues. I can understand which ones we should be working on. I can look at the closed issues to see what versions we fix things in, and therefore, which one, you know, when should we ship a new version of the field to close that out. Um, but there's another whole category of things as a product manager I often want to know. Namely, who's using my application and how much are they using it? So of course, my test application here doesn't have much usage information behind it. But if I click over to the Usage tab, we see a little bit of data. To make this much more interesting, though, I'm going to go back to the Loop Server dashboard. And we're going to go ahead and look at an actual one of our Loop field applications for beta users. That has a lot more information, and it's a little more interesting to go look at. So I've gone back to the dashboard. We're going to go ahead and look at the Loop Server. I'm going to go ahead and click on Sessions here. And this takes me straight to the usage information for Loop Server. Now, this is our beta community, so it's a bit of a skewed subset of information. But it does demonstrate uh, what we're doing here with recording. Now, by default, I'm seeing the last month of information. And you can see that we show four charts of information um, right off the top. Computers over time by version, sessions by version, and then computers and, and sessions by operating system. We found from talking to folks that these are the number one characteristics that they're interested in subsetting and dividing by. And so that's why we go ahead and do that. So you can see in here that um, I can actually see the versions that are employed, and I can see the counts. And if I hover over any point, I can see the specific metrics. So for example, I can look and know that, OK, you know, 350 first got some use on, in fact, the 20th. And I can see that, that work is shifting to that. Now, if I want to, I can go ahead and use this filter option to change the range and scale of what I'm looking at. I can do a couple things here that are particularly interesting. One is, is that for every release, we, uh, we understand a category of that release. Now, the system ships with a default, on, with a default notion of beta, internal, and release. Uh, but you can, in fact, customize this list with your own types. So for example, if I tell it release, it will drop out of the chart anything that was not actually a shipping commercial release. Since we send beta traffic to this, in fact, now it, everything drops out except for pretty much the, the 350 I build, which we actually ship to customers. If I go back and say, oh, go ahead and include official internal releases, I see, I see additional information. Now, also, let's show any, any release type. I can also change the date range and say that I want to see information. Let's say I want to see a wider set of time. Let me go ahead and look back to February and go ahead and see it by day as well. And I can change that to being from by day to being by week or month uh, if I want to get different summarization intervals. Now, again, here I'm looking at an application. You can see that, not unsurprisingly, as I look over the past uh, several months, you can see that the, what versions are in use changed. Here's a 303, which was one of the earliest beta versions of Loop. You can see that it was used widely, and its use tapered off to essentially nothing. Uh, likewise, as new things came in, they show up, and those builds pop in. Now, if I want to look at computers by operating system, that charts down here. I can see the distribution of how folks are running things. Now I'm looking at a server application, so it's not surprising that I'm seeing essentially virtually everyone running Server 2008 R2, some folks running Server 2012, and a small folks running a, the server application on desktop. I get a more interesting chart, frankly, if I go back and look at the beta users of Loop Desktop, because that group was a little more varied in, in where they ran things. So if I go into here, we'll see a little more varied uh, OS usage chart. So I can see, again, computers over time by operating system. Here we are. I can see Windows 8 in use, Windows 7, 
and a little bit of server use. Now, as a product manager, what's useful for me about this is I know a couple of things. One is I know what OSs people are predominantly using. So, for example, is it worth us starting to tailor features to newer capabilities coming out in a newer operating system? Also, though, I can get a good sense of whether or not it's worth still supporting something that's old. For example, if I go back and change the filter and look at this by over a much wider set of time, I may decide, um, for example, that it's no longer worth supporting, say, Windows XP. If I don't see any XP users over a long period of time, then I probably can get rid of it. And in fact, we have just a sliver of XP users and a sliver of Vista users. But the set is so small, it likely is actually worth, us, worth it to us that we could, if we wanted to, discontinue using that. Now, by the way, there actually is a drill down through this chart that will show us exactly who's using what operating system and, and what versions they're running to let you understand. Uh, for example, maybe those Windows XP users are actually folks using old releases of the application. And if that's the case, you don't care about them because they're not upgrading anyway to newer versions. I can't show you that, though, because this actually does have customer information in this side of the system. Uh, so while that's more interesting data, at a certain level, we can't disclose some of that lower information. That said, though, you can try this out easily on your own application very quickly to get a sense of who's using your application, oh, you know, over time what versions are they using, how often are they running it, and what operating systems are they using. So this gives me the core summary information I wanted to know as a product manager. By the way, Loop Desktop has an ability through its anal uh, Analyze Sessions feature to do a, a very flexible set of pivots and charting from all of the characteristics of the session. So if you, have, if you have the question, well, I want to ask a very detailed question about if I look only at certain versions and I only look at uh, you know, certain ranges of time and what operating systems, what service packs or screen resolutions are still in use, that all can be accomplished using the full loop desktop tool. And that's part of our strategy of making sure that the web application can answer the common direct questions very quickly and then if you need to, you can go back to the desktop application for the deep answers and the more complicated dynamic operations. OK, so we've seen how Loop Server helps me as a technical lead triage problems and uh, assign and, and triage them both by saying something's not an issue, suppress. I'm not sure about it, ignore. Or it isn't a problem, make it an issue. Uh, we've also seen how developers can use that to get assigned items, work the problem, note it's fixed, but if it's not addressed, it will automatically be reopened. And yet the system won't reopen things that you don't want it to because they're still happening in the field even though you've already fixed them. Also, as a product manager, we've shown how you can go back and see not just overall information about the health of your application, but can also see the usage information of your application. The last section I want to go into is, is the notification capability. We recognize that Loop is going to fit into your existing environment, just like it needs to work potentially with your defect tracking system. Um, we want to make sure that you can uh, fit it into your workflow. And notifications are a core part of that. So I'm going to go ahead into notifications. And we have notifications of three, three different types of notifications. Log events, something that, by, if you're familiar with our Gibraltar project, has been around for a long time. It's for when you want to get an email every time something happens, no matter what. So for example, I can create a rule that says every time, uh, every time, for example, loop, a loop server has a error, then I want to see the details of that. And, here's, and, and this is the address I want it to go to. Now, even if the error is resolved, even if it's you know, a known issue and it's fixed, when you set it up at this level, you're saying, I want to know every time. So this is designed for the operations team. Uh, to be able to work with. Because from their standpoint, if, for example, if you're having a network connection problem, every single time that happens, they may want to know about it. I agree a number of these. And you'll notice that, by the way, I can selectively enable or disable them. And that's useful for when you may have defined a set of items, but maybe you go on vacation and you want to turn them off. Or you um, have them in there temporarily during, just say, test intervals. And you're not in a test cycle right now, and so you don't want to get those errors. Moving up a click to application events, remember application events are the unique problems that have happened for an application. So um, no matter how many times they happen, they're just one application event. One of the nice features you can say is, 
send me a notification every time a new application event happens. That means that's a case where an application event happens that has never happened before. So if you think about it again as a technical lead or a product manager, I may want to receive an email for applications I'm responsible for every single time a something happens for the first time that we've never seen before. We can use that to somewhat narrow things down. You'll notice the criteria in this case allows us to not to, to be a little bit more um, circumspect. For example, I only want to see information about new application events that are in beta releases or 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 final releases. I don't want to see them for the uh, for developer releases. So every time a developer creates a new def, uh, bug in their application and throws an error, I don't want to get an email on it. It has to at least make it to the beta team before I want to get an email on it. Likewise, if I'm the product man, the technical leader, the product manager, if I'm responsible for re for reviewing application events, I may want to receive an email every time something gets added to that list for me to review. Finally, at the issues level, I can choose to subscribe to uh, for applications I'm responsible to for to uh, events when issues are opened, changed, or closed. Now, if the issue is assigned to me, I will always receive these uh, these notifications. So if the issue is assigned to me and someone else changes the issue, I will receive an email. Or the, if the issue gets assigned to me, I'll receive an email. Um, or if an issue that I close was reopened, I will get the email. In all those cases, I'll get the email. If I'm the one taking the action in some of those cases, we don't because if you, obviously there's no reason to send you an email saying that an issue has been changed when you made the change. They don't have to manually register for any of those events. That happens automatically. This is really for product managers and technical leads to register for things at the application-wide level. And again, they can cheerfully go in and, and set up one of these events. And if they decide they don't want to have it temporarily, simply uncheck the enabled box and not receive those notifications for a period of time. Now, there's a number of other capabilities in the administration interface to handle a range of scenarios that are getting a little more advanced. Uh, and I'm going to skip over that, other than one last thing, which is that I've been showing how you can manually triage items. But we also let you define rules for triage. For example, we have a rule we've defined in ours that says, for all sessions, if it's a warning, we want to ignore it, meaning review it, remove it from the review list, treat it as if someone had manually selected it, and, and say, ignore. That's not an unreasonable default approach. But um, it is, uh, you know, it, it may be something you want to do, it may be something you don't want to do, or you may want to do it more narrowly. But I can also do something, do other rules. Like, for example, we're really, we're, we really focus on the loop server service that runs in the background for everybody processing data. And so we actually have a rule that says, if there's an error for the for loop server service, just make an issue out of it. And we'll work it at that level. And in fact, assign it to me. So, any, so basically, anything comes into this particular hub, if it's a loop server service error, I get, a, I get a notification of it, and it gets created in an issue. So I know anytime a problem is showing up, a new distinct problem is showing up for loop servers. And again, remember that we're automatically duping this so that if 1,000 different computers in the field all get find the same no reference exception. You're not going to get a thousand of these. You'll get exactly one, and that's the core capability of Loop. So the last thing, just to quickly cover, is let's review a little bit about uh, the pricing and how all this works. The key things to take away on the pricing side is Loop desktop and agent are free. The Loop agents available on NuGet. It's also available on our distribution. You can go to our website and you can go ahead and download this. It works with any .NET app. That means um, mono as well. You can use Loop Desktop with Mono. Um, you can use it with uh, any. I don't care if it's an, an add an add into Visual Studio or Excel, all the way down through a full fledged you know, Windows service system. Um, someone's asked the question uh, in the webinar: Does Loop only support Windows Desktop and Server Application Monitoring? What about Mono on Linux and Mac? Yes, Mono on Linux and Mac is supported. What about Windows Phone, RT, and uh, iOS, Android? We are not currently supporting Mono Touch, but that is on the roadmap to add. We also are going to have options coming out later this year for cross-platform support that will help hit Windows Phone and Windows RT. Uh, unfortunately, Windows RT and Windows Phone are so far afield from .NET that it's not really feasible for us to port across to them. I'm sure if anyone's ever tackled those systems, you know how that goes. But Loop Desktop is free. Um, the agent is free. That means you can collect as much data as you want. We're not ever charging you by how much data you're collecting on the out end, or how many computers that is. You're not licensing it for each individual server you have or whatever. Um, the loop server itself, 
which uh, is an optional add-on that we've been talking through today, is available two ways. You can do the software service approach, which we host on our platform uh, in our data center, and it's available on a subscription basis for as low as $49 a month. Um, or uh, you can also license it and run it on your premises or in your own data center or wherever you are, and that pricing starts at $24.95 with a single user license, and you can then add users above that. And what is a user? A user is an account to log into the website. So each of those is a user uh, as far as system goes. So you can see how we're aligning the pricing with the number of folks that are actually going to be using the system, not based on, again, how many servers you're collecting data from or, or the like. And there's a ton of capabilities I haven't gone into today uh, that go beyond above and beyond what we've talked to already. If you have any questions after today's webinar, I would really encourage you to reach out to us by emailing support at GibraltarSoftware.com uh, or catch us on chat. If you have something for me personally, you can always find me in, on Twitter, at Kendall Miller. Uh, if otherwise, uh, I'm open for any last questions you have. So one question from early on I want to make sure that I got back to you and nailed was, can you give a bit more detail on how Loop collects more machine information as more instances of the same exception occur? Um, we're collecting all of those characteristics of the machine uh, and we are um, collecting the actual detail behind each exception. Um, so there, you know, each occurrence of this exception. As that information is flowing in, we are extending that. But let me go ahead and let me see if I can find a reasonable error that will have a good amount of information on it. So here's actually a pretty good example. So um, on this item, what we can see is, in fact, um, no, no, only eight computers. I didn't pick as well as I wanted. Um, it happens many, many times. In fact, it's happened 17 million times on eight computers. This is an example of an error we had that windmilled that happened on just a very small number of computers um, that we did go ahead off and fix. And it's a good example of our scalability that, that we dedupe this information so that that's straightforward to do. This one's got a much broader coverage. So if I go look at the statistics for this error, um, you can see its rate over time. You can see uh, other breakdown charts of, of how it's affecting who it's affecting. Uh, and if I go ahead and drill into this event, you can see down below, it's not unsurprising. This error does not correlate to any of these particular characteristics. So we're starting to see a pretty good laundry list of the different op options of what people are running showing up below. Uh, and that's not unsurprising because this problem fundamentally just doesn't co correlate to those items. Now, by the way, one of the items I left off earlier, just quickly show, is that if I have an issue that's confusing and it's not easy to understand, say, for example, what's happening here, a great feature we have is, is this related events feature. This is based on analysis of all the data. We're looking for other unique problems that tend to show up in the same session files as this problem. Uh, and, we do that, and when we do that analysis and then come back with it, you'll often find that a number of these items actually are all correlated. And we'll let you take all of those and add them to the same issue so that you can actually go ahead and join them all together and treat them as one item. Um, and that's a great capability because, again, you might, you, if you have, often not, you'll have a production error that has an error, and there's three more errors that cascade from it, and they're all really the same problem. And we'll let you relate that to the same issue and open it then up as one problem, not multiple problems. Well, if there's no other questions, again, you can always reach out to us after the fact, and I appreciate everyone's time today. I'm sure we didn't get to everything you wanted to, but I would encourage you to go ahead and download Loop. The desktop is free. Uh, you can get a 30-day on-premises trial, or you can do a 30-day trial of the Loop service online. Um, both are easy to get up and going. We have some great setup wizards to make it happen, and we do provide full support for uh, getting those live. So with that, again, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, hey, have a great day.